Okay, welcome to Chapter 8. Um, uh, we're going to talk about uh, some more applications. In this case, we're going to change our, uh, our method, if you will, to instead of talking about individual securities, we're now going to look at projects of the corporation. So we want to talk about ultimately a process that's referred to as capital budgeting. So capital budgeting is the process of evaluating long-term assets consistent with the goal of maximizing owner wealth. So we have two kinds of expenditures in a company. A capital expenditure is typically a large outlay that has a time frame or a lifespan greater than a year. Operating expenditures are very short term typically much smaller in magnitude, and they all have lifespans of less than one year. So we're looking at analyzing long-term projects. So we're gonna look at uh, the kinds of projects that we can uh, analyze. Uh, we know that we're looking at long-term decisions. These are very large expenditures. Sometimes it's very difficult, if not impossible, to change our decision once we implement the project. And finally, capital budgeting is a picture, if you will, of the implementation of the company's strategic plan. So uh, the point of this slide is, this is a very critical uh, uh, decision for the company. It, is, uh, um, it, it requires due diligence in uh, forecasting. It requires um, us to eliminate as much as possible some of the gamesmanship that might be played by some of the um, um, managers of our company that are trying to expand their operations. So it is a very critical decision to the long run health of the corporation. So we have to ask some questions, right? If we're gonna talk about some techniques, what do those techniques need to tell us? First of all, do those techniques, do they look at all the information? Are all the cash flows considered in the outcome of the technique or the analysis of the technique? Time value of money, is it considered? What about adjusting for risk? Does, is risk adjusted for in any way? Um, do, do I have an ability to ultimately rank projects? Sometimes I may need to find uh, the best of two or three. So I need to have a methodology that will allow me to rank them the right way. And in the end, does the technique or will this decision ultimately add value to the firm? And I think that's probably one of our critical um, techniques or, or decisions as we're looking at this. We wanna make sure that capital budgeting follows through by trying to maximize or increase the wealth of shareholders. So what is the process, right? We have to have proposals, right? There's usually some type of a committee that gets together and they accept project proposals from the firm, from the different divisions, different uh, uh, plants, etc. We're going to review and analyze that, the, those uh, proposals. We're going to make some kind of a decision, right? We're going to apply some techniques to determine whether or not it makes sense to do the projects or not. In the end, after we approve of the techniques, then obviously we have to implement the project. However, it doesn't stop there. Like all good decisions, we need to follow up. We need to monitor what's happening. At the very least, we would like to know how close we are in our forecasting, right? What, what's the uh, comparison between the predicted revenues and costs of the project and the actual revenues and costs? We want to be able to bring those all together if we can to try to determine whether or not our forecasting methodology is sound or not. When we look at projects, there's two kinds of projects that we can look at. We can look at projects that were referred to as independent projects. Um, they're unrelated to each other. If you accept one project, it has no impact on the others 
uh, in the discussion of whether or not to do things or not do things. Mutually exclusive projects, though, are projects that compete with each other. So when you accept one project, you eliminate the other project. So we have independent projects and mutually exclusive projects. We're going to work under an assumption, at least initially, that companies have unlimited funds available. Um, uh, most large companies are really this way. I mean, it's hard to imagine that uh, uh, companies like uh, Microsoft, Google, uh, General Motors, right? Any of those large companies that you can name. It's kind of hard to imagine that they could have a project that they'd want to do that if they didn't want, if, if, if they didn't have the money to purchase it, that they couldn't find the money. Most good big companies have lots of access to resources. That might not mean that they like the price that they're going to pay for, so they may ultimately turn down the project. But in general, uh, they don't have too much trouble actually getting uh, cash. Small companies, though, and quite frankly, uh, the way most corporations actually work, is that the company is going to fix the capital budget. So they're going to be uh, under the concept or under the, uh, the, uh, the term here is referred to as capital rationing. So management is going to set a fixed number of, that's available for capital expenditures, and they're not going to spend a dollar more. And we'll talk about that as we get towards the uh, end of this chapter and uh, maybe the next chapter. In the end, we have to decide to do a project or not to do a project. So we have to either re accept or reject. That's one of the methodologies or one of the things we'll have to decide. Now we decide this from a group of independent projects because they don't, they're not related to each other. You can accept and reject all. You can accept some, reject the others. It really doesn't matter. You're going to choose those projects that ultimately are going to increase the company's wealth. The ranking approach, though, um, says that you know we have a set of assets or a set of projects that are really identical projects, and we only need one. So we have to be able to identify which is the best of that group. So this ranking approach actually is what causes a problem for us because our techniques, since they come from different concepts, um, they may conflict with how they see the value of projects as to their priority. So ranking is what ultimately is going to cause some issues for us. So let's think about we have a project, right? Bennett Company, they're looking at two projects. Project A requires an investment of 42 grand and B is 45,000. Now the operating cash flows, and we'll talk about how this is determined in the next chapter, but those all the operating cash flows uh, are provided here. So for project A, you see it's a five-year project, you get 14,000 a year. And for project B, you can see the cash flows. So now what we want to do is just very quickly, let's go to the capital budgeting techniques worksheet. Here's capital budgeting techniques. Let me get it into view here. And this is where you would input the data. Right here, right? That's where you put the data for the cash flows. If you're going to be making some decisions, we need to know what our benchmarks are. What's our decision criterion? But you would enter this data here. So here's negative 42,000. And then the next was, I believe it was $14,000 a year for five years. So we put that down here. There's our project. That's project A. Should we do the project or not do the project? Let's, let's use a discount rate of 10%. I don't know what we're going to use later in the problem. But let's use 10%. If you put in the discount rate, we now can calculate the... Um, cash flow or the the different decisions and we're going to talk about the six decisions in uh, in this class or in this chapter sorry so let's move on see what happens next the first technique to talk about is the payback method 
It basically tells me the amount of time it's required to gather and recover the, uh, the uh, investment in the project. So it's a length of time. Uh, management sets this length of time. So our first decision rule says, if the payback period is less than the maximum, then you accept the project, right? If the payback period is greater than the maximum, you reject the project. Now, one of the things that this textbook and many textbooks do is they don't tell you what to do if it's equal. Um, we wanna follow the textbook's version here for their uh, test bank. So greater than means you accept, less than means you reject, the equal sign means you're indifferent. Uh, quite frankly, I personally think uh, from the information that I've been gathering over time and some of the logical inferences that are made from independent projects, uh, the equal sign typically goes with the accept. Um, but that is uh, more of a personal uh, opinion of, of what the actual decision rule should be. So here we have the two projects, project A and B. Here's project A, here's our investment, 10% rate return, I lucky guessed that one. And you can see here that the payback period is three years. And our benchmark for this project is three years. So if you wanted to get your money back in three years or less, then this project fulfills your needs. Project B, again our benchmark is three years, and the payback period is 2.4 years. So we're getting our money back quicker than the three years required. So if these two projects were mutually exclusive, right, we had to pick the best of the two. Project B is better because Project B gets us our money back quicker. Now your textbook doesn't necessarily talk about the discounted payback method. Essentially, it takes the present values of these cash flows and does the calculation. So and then we have what? Uh, the discounted payback period is 3.7 for project A, which is more than the three and a half required. For project B, it's 3.3. And again, at three and a half years, project B fits both mixes uh, or both techniques and both character, uh, criterion for us to make the decision. So again, that's essentially the process of going through this course through these techniques. We're gonna talk about the technique, we're gonna look at the answers, talk about what the answers mean once we're finished with that. So next, what about, what are the pros and cons of this technique? The pros are it's very simple, it's very intuitive. Uh, it is a simple risk measure, although it's not truly a risk uh, quantification. Um, lots of people use the payback method, especially in very small firms. The downturn, though, are really very critical. Number one is um, the actual criterion is determined by management. There's no methodology for how we decided 3.0 years is what we wanted. It doesn't consider wealth maximization, which is what we would want all of these criterion to, uh, techniques to follow and it does not utilize the time value of money. Now, when you use the discounted cash flow method, at least the time value of money isn't a, an issue anymore, but these first two are still in play. So the payback period has some very critical kinds of downturns, right? It doesn't account for time value of money. It does not account for the riskiness of the cash flows. It does not address um, any indication about wealth or value. And, uh, you know, its project ranking is, is suspect. Um, so should we consider using the payback period for our decisions? And the answer is it should never be used all by itself. It should be used in conjunction with other decisions. And quite frankly, in the end, as you can see, once you have the cash flows, it really doesn't matter uh, it's just a formula is what gives you the answers for these things. So it's not like we have to do all several different tests. It's just one forecasting of cash flows and formulas to solve for the capital budgeting solutions. 
again, while it's easy to compute and easy to understand, again, it has these drawbacks. Um, if we're going to use it with, the, uh, we would want to certainly use it in conjunction with the net present value technique. Um, we, we, we need just to have a little bit more. In fact, this is what the, some authors refer to the pay, payback period as being an unsophisticated measure. Right? We want to bring it up to the modern times, if you will. So here are two different, just real quick to go through the examples here. Here are these, the, the DeYarman Enterprises. There's two projects. We know what the investments are. We know what the cash flows are. And we calculate ultimately the payback period for these two. They're the same, three years and three years. So what does that tell you about these two projects? Are they identical? Right? They're both $50,000 investments, but this project, this silver project, gets its cash back much quicker than the other one. It's still three years, but again, the, the purpose of showing this is to show that you know, there are some issues with the payback method. Here's project X and Y. Right? Again, they both cost $10,000. Project X has it two years three years for project Y, but the two years because it gets its project, its cash flows back much quicker. And in fact, what about the 4,000 and 3,000 year? The payback period doesn't even look at those three. It says these are the three you need. This one is not important. It's, it's not going to be part of the calculation. So again, there are some weaknesses associated with this payback period that we that we have to be worried about. The next technique is really the technique. It's the gold standard, if you will. It's the net present value. We talked a little bit about this in the time value chapter, but it is a technique that looks at the present value of all the cash inflows and makes a comparison to those to the initial investment. So it is a cost benefit analysis and it uses a discount rate that's equal to the cost of capital of the company, which in the end is a measurement or includes the riskiness of the company. So again, net present value measures the value created by the project. We have our basic rules here. If the net present value is greater than or equal to zero, you would buy the asset. If it's positive, you accept the project. That means it's going to add value to the firm. That increases the wealth to owners. Again, net present value is a direct measure of how well this project will meet the goal of increasing shareholder wealth. If it's greater than zero, it's going to earn a higher rate of return than its cost of capital. So it has a higher return than the cost of financing. And of course, in the end, that leads to increasing wealth of owners. So our solutions are here. So in our example here, we can see that project A has a net present value of 11,000, project B, 10,924. Both projects have net present values greater than zero. So both projects will add wealth to the company. So if you could do both of these projects, you would like to do them both. Uh, however, if you could only pick one, you would want to choose the one that was going to maximize wealth the most. And of course, that is project A is going to increase wealth by a, a little bit over uh, $100. So it's a better, Project A is a better project than B because it increases wealth more. So what about the criterion? It meets all the desirable criteria in it. All the cash flows, time value money, it adjusts for risks. You can rank mutually exclusive projects. It's directly related to the value of the company. And again, it's the dominant method. That is, it always gives the right answer. Now, the question that we frequently have then is if it's always giving the right answer, why are we going to do all these other techniques? 
Well, all the techniques give information. They all tell us things about the company. They all give us information about the company's decision-making process. So we want to involve as many different opinions and techniques as we possibly can. That's the end of part two, part one of the capital budgeting chapter.